talk is The Strange Return of a Lesbian Body, and I want to thank Elizabeth Ladinson for inviting me. Um, I haven't worked on BT before, and it was really lovely to um, spend this time thinking through the importance of her work for us today. So I'm going to just go ahead without further ado and start. Prologue. My mother's spine or words have edges. I can tell who it is because I know that tailbone. The delta funnels down from two dim dimples. Two dimples. Okay, I start over. I can tell who it is because I know that tailbone. The delta funnels down from two dimples on the hips into the crack I know is my mother's bottom. Je découvre que ta peau peut être enlevée délicatement, pellicule par pellicule. Je tire. They diagnose the pain in her 70-year-old tailbone as spondylolithesis. It happens with age. The surgeon makes a six-inch incision to expose her spine. Une toile d'araignée de nerfs. Les nerfs, les pellicules, les chines. He pulls apart the nerves like an electrician untangling a rat's nest of wires. Je parcours toute son échine à doigts légers. Then removes a piece of bone from the good part of her back and transplants it to the problem vertebra. Bone on bone will weave itself together. Corps caverneux, les bulles du vagin, le squelette, la colonne vertébrale, le cœur. Les fragments s'assemblent. Sans équivoque, il faut que soit traversé les chines et ses versants. Le corps est une gosse qu'il entreprend. Certains aspects de la réalité qui nous mettent dans cet état quand la vision se fait comme théorique. Une intuition qui intérieure pose la lucidité comme technique de recueillement. Du fictif au politique, frôlant la citation. Mais bruyamment sous l'épiderme, la tentation de surgir par part. So I can seek my radiant mother across the throng of capitals, across queer as it may sound. Monique Vitig. One, ethopoiesis, or a geontological joke. The struggle for words is an ethical struggle. As Anne Carson puts it in Eros Bittersweet, words do have edges, so do you. Our task is, I think, like Carson's, like Vitig's, to trouble those edges, to turn them into chantiers, spaces to be worked with our tools. Monique Vitig's Chantier Littéraire, Edgework as a Material Struggle with Thought as Words, has something to teach us in this time of new materialisms. Unlike Vitig, today's new materialists turn away from language to pursue what Christopher Nealon calls projects that scale their enterprise to suit what they take to be a larger world than the one we were able to study in the days of the linguistic turn. Vitig's, dare I say, old materialist lesbian body returns to trouble the anti-textualist, anti-linguistic term that characterizes a vast array of new materialisms, speculative realisms, and object-oriented ontologies of various kinds, from Maya Sue's archifossil to Timothy Morton's hyper-objects, to the mundane, incommensurable things we find in gutters. And I'm just going to list a bunch of things. I'm not going to read them all, but we have them. So these lists of things in object oriented ontology from Jane Bennett, Graham Harmon, Ian Bogost. One could continue for a very long time with such object-oriented lists, and that's my context for returning to BT. That return has offered me surprising resources for rethinking our present, a present that is not quite BT's own. In its return, Le Corps Lesbien exposes us to the genealogical fractures of that strange Nietzschean recursive movement whereby one can track, repérer, guetter, retrouver, ce qui passe pour n'avoir point d'histoire, les sentiments, l'amour, le corps lesbien. And I think this is the, the part that's about the abjection as Elizabeth defined it this morning, that which is cast out. This recursive emergence of events in their lacunae in the moments when they did not take place is how poets speak. Like Don Quixote in Les Moëlle Shows, who speaks through the resemblances in the age of representation, Vitig is strangely, poetically untimely. She offers an old materialist corps lesbien, 
It's capital letters, another kind of list, that speaks in the midst of a new materialist confrontation with seemingly catastrophic shifts on the planet Earth. This return of the old as a strangeness within the new, so old materialism within new materialism, was unexpected for me. Living with VT for 30 years, teaching and rereading her again and again, I thought I knew her. Living with an author, Jane Gallup writes, in the depths of the author, is having fragments from her text in our dailiness. The author transmigrates into our life, as a co I'm sorry, into our life, as a coexistence. The two bodies exist together, even though one is dead. The transmigration makes the familiar strange. Cohabitation disperses the body. We admire a text, Gallup writes, citing Bach, because it scatters well, like ashes strewn to the wind. What better way to describe the scattering power of the Colisbien, a text whose fragmentation gives it the mobility to be able to travel? In my own recent dailiness, preparing for this conference, Le Corps Lesbien transmigrated into my life as the aging body of my lesbian mother, then back again to Vitig. Lifting the skin, I traced a spine of thought, connected bone with bone like a surgeon, as I wrote, in a technique de recueillement that I hoped would move me du fictif au politique. Strangely reproductive, la reproduction xx plus xx égale xx, I found that the lesbian body scattered well. So here's the spine of thought I've been tracing. Thinking genealogically, I take up Le Corps Lesbien today in the midst of an imaginary of planetary catastrophe as a way to rethink the anti-linguistic new materialist turn I just sketched. The term Anthropocene, a word invented in 2000 by Paul Crutzen to rename our contemporary geological age as the epic where humans have become a geological force, is one of the many that points to contemporary catastrophism. It signals a deep time perspective beyond the frame of individual humans, the human species, or even life itself. With the term comes the specter of catastrophic ecological crises brought about by climate change, biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, and a breakdown of Earth system processes, all threatening to cascade into the sixth extinction. Let me be clear, Le Corps Lesbien is not, in my view, an eco-feminist, utopian Amazonian elsewhere to a rapacious patriarchal culture. Rather, Le Corps Lesbien reinscribes anthropocentric violence as edges to be worked. Vitig's grammatical violence, oops, sorry, a fractured jeu who shatters the two into morceaux dispersés, stages an ethical struggle with words at the edges of our thinking. Paradoxically, that violence not only shatters and scatters, but also restores. Je te prends morceau par morceau, je te rassemble bout à bout. But as a genealogical restoration, that reassemblage exposes cracks in the ground of our thinking. As Foucault once put it, c'est à notre seul silencieux et naïvement immobile que nous rendons ses ruptures, son instabilité, ses failles. In Le Corps Lesbien, that restoration of failles is a restoration of edges, chantier of words, as thought spaces to be reworked. Contra the new materialism's anti-textualism, I argue that the edges of our words and the edges of our world rub against each other in a relational ontology, you might even want to think of it as a kind of fautage, performed by Le Corps Lesbien. That ontology is not only or simply human, it is geological, tectonic, what Beth Povinelli calls geontological. And because the relational ontological struggle with words is also an ethical struggle, the restoration of those edges is ethopoetic. poetic Je me perds dans ta géographie, Vitig writes toward the end of Le Corps Lesbien. The movement of the text between continent and islands is geographical and geological, geontological. Adieu continent noir de misère et de peine, Nous embarquons pour les îles brillantes et radieuses. At the same time, it is iterative, citational, intertextual. Du Bellet's heureux qui comme Ulysse a fait un beau voyage becomes heureuse aussi comme Ulysse a je pouvais revenir dans mon voyage. <laughs> so too with Valéry, his cimetière marin gets rewritten 
in various ways. I'm not going to go through all of it because I want to. Okay, so. Maigre, mortalité noire et dorée becomes the set again, dorée, adorée, moi, or les lesbos, moi, et dorée. There's also a cintiaire at the end of Le Corps Lesbien that I think is also invoking la um, She also rewrites Watteau and countless others, Baudelaire, Homer, Sappho, Egyptian and Greek myth, the Bible. Frolin, la citation, as Ponsard puts it, in, um, in, in Le Corps Lesbien, geography and aesthetics, geology and words, siflot, they rub together. To work one is to work the other. This lesbian transmigration of scattered parts is also, as Viti puts it, a joke. There is no such thing as a corps lesbien. As Colette once wrote, il n'y a pas de gomorre. She's invoking Proust here. In a 1999 interview, Viti says, Quand j'ai trouvé le titre corps lesbien, l'association de ces deux mots m'a fait rire. This laughter, like Foucault's when he reads Borges, is a quaking that unsettles thought. Atopie, aphasie. It exposes the non-lieu, the atopos, inhabited by ceux dans le langage est ruiné, those without le commun du lieu et du nom. That empty but peopled non-place is the lesbian body as ontological joke. Thus we see Viti writing as a genealogist in that Foucauldian sense, seizing events in their return, defining le point de leur lacune, le moment où ils n'ont pas eu lieu. Viti's retraversal of the ontological joke is fierce and excessive, G ontological, je ris d'un rire féroce. When faced with catastrophe, the body laughs. Its reward, not despair, but the Nietzschean cheerfulness of a gay science. Two, lesbianizing the correlationist circle. So I'm gonna get a little into philosophy here, but I, I promise it's super quick. <laughs> I want to hone these reflections on the Corps Lesbian as, as an ethopoietic practice in the Anthropocene by focusing for a moment on the pronomial relation that structures Viti's book. The impossible I lover transcribed as the split je, always in relation to a beloved, a tu. I contrast this I you relation in the Corps Lesbian with speculative realism's critique of what it calls correlationism. The thought being relation that routes all knowledge of objects through a subject in an endless correlationist circle. The circle, speculative realists argue, keeps us from thinking givenness, the object, the in itself. Rejecting the circle, they dismiss the subject of the subject-object relation that defines the circle, instead inviting us, as Mayasu puts it, to get out of ourselves, to grasp the in itself, to know what is, whether we are or not. I reframe this homo-philosophical boo-boy celebration of objects <laughs> uh, through the lens of Vitig's corps lesbien. Vitig's chantier of words offers an other than subjective, lesbian corrective to speculative realism's anti-subjective, anti-linguistic critique of the correlation circle. So, as is well known, in The Mark of Gender, Vitti draws attention to the key pronoun of the lesbian body, describing the entire text as a reverie about the beautiful analysis of the pronouns je and tu by the linguist Emile Benveniste. What happens when Vitti reframes the correlationist subject-object relation as the grammatical relation between a je and a tu? And what are the ethical, ontological, g-ontological stakes of that reframing? Importantly, when we return to Benveniste, we find that the je tu relation is not the same as the relation between a subject and an object, a self and an other. Je n'emploie je qu'en m'adressant à quelqu'un qui sera dans mon allocution un tu, Benveniste writes. Aucun des deux termes ne se conçoit sans l'autre. Qu'on cherche à cela un parallèle, on n'en trouvera pas. Unique est la condition de l'homme dans le langage. Ainsi tombent les vieilles antinomies du moi et de l'autre. These old antinomies are precisely the terms speculative realists describe as the subject-object correlationist circle. Unlike the speculative realists, Bentley's <coughs> is amazed by the difference between the subject-object and je tu. The personal pronouns he writes are distinguished from every other linguistic designation in that they refer to neither to concepts nor to individuals. Il ne renvoie ni un concept ni un individu. Rather, 
Je se réfère à l'acte de discours individuel, où il est prononcé, et il en désigne le locuteur. Unlike rationalism's subject generalized as a concept, or empiricism's subject particularized as an individual, for Benveniste, the jeu can only be understood as an act of locution. This difference is crucial to my uptake of Vitek for a counterattack, or what she calls in the chantier uh, littéraire, a contre-champ, which I love. A counterattack against speculative realism's anti-linguistic turn in a transcendental celebration of objects that simply brackets locution as a linguistic act. Mayasu's call to get out of ourselves, to grasp the in itself, to know what it is, whether we are or not, is a locutionary act that reinscribes a je, here as a we, even as it claims to bracket the subject. Vitek's linguistic chantier reminds us that ontological thinking, to know what is, as Mayasu puts it, requires locutional acts. Um, and I should say, parenthetically, that these are relational, performative, contingent acts in which Mayasu and other speculative realists engage every time they write or utter a sentence. In marking the non lieu of the lesbian body as modes of address that both bind and split, a je and a tu, the deep stage of what Benveniste calls the fait remarquable of pronomial acts of locution. Thus, the je tu relation of le corps lesbien rewrites the correlation of circle and its critique by ethopoietically reworking locution's philosophical implications. And if some have described Vitek's text as an ironic autobiography, the lesbian body's excess as ontological joke gives the autobiography geontological dimensions. As geontology, Le Corps Lesbien's ironic edgework reworks a strange metamorphic, not quite human je through a, a, an autoreferential self-splitting writing of a life held together from the very start by a relation to a two who is already dead. So those of you who've read the text know that the two is dead from the first page. The situation at the start of Le Corps Lesbien is the paradoxical condition of locution and writing. Je parle sur le cadavre des autres, Foucault once said. I speak over the corpses of others. As in Foucault, so too in VT. Je's geontological lesbian life begins impossibly in the death of a two, without whom, this is Benveni's point, the je cannot exist. In rethinking this autobiography as a not quite personal, not quite human story of a writing after someone or something which, in our catastrophic thinking, is like our planet, anthropocenic, already dead, already gone over the horizon, could we reread Le Corps Lesbien as an ecological love poem, an ecologos, but where logos is displaced by a poiesis, might we read the text as an eco-poem? Eco the love poem to the earth, as body, as goddess, as mother, is of course a familiar trope. And not just for poets. Philosophical approaches to ecological ethics tend to reinvoke this image of mother earth as the war object of our love. Rereading Levinas on the ethics of the face, philosopher James Hatley writes, a planet can be defaced too, such a defacement occurs when the maternity of the earth, its capacity to give birth and to sustain life, to fructify creation, is ignored or even worse, attacked or beaten down by human beings. The call of the other, for Hatley, is the call of earth as mother to be saved, because to save her is to resurrect ourselves in what Hatley is convinced is what he calls our goodness. But in Vitek, as in Foucault, such redemptive scenarios are radically transformed. If the two is Mother Earth, chanter une cantate à la déesse ma mère, that mother is, as the two, already dead. Thus, two's opening death in Le Corps Lesbien marks what Hatley calls the maternity of the Earth as an absence. Mère, mère, pourquoi m'as-tu abandonné? Il n'y a pas de trace de toi, un vide à la place de toi. J'interroge une absence si étrange qu'elle me cause un trou au-dedans de mon corps. If tu es Mother Earth, she is cette non-présence où tu t'abîmes. La déesse, ma mère, is une déesse monstre de pourriture that speaks to the je, not in a Levinasian ethics of the face, but in a relation to the Earth as une absence étrange, un monstre. Vitek's writerly rekindling of a maternal earth that is already dead, Je te tue ainsi mon plus beau monstre, geontologically lesbianizes the text as a monstrous, necrophilic love poem. In this sense, to lesbianize means to reframe the philosophical subject-object relation 
as an act of locution that genealogically tracks the emergence of a third monstrous, beautiful, but dead space en dehors of the asymmetrical subject-object man-woman relation analyzed by Beauvoir. As a locution, as an interlocutional act, this is the term Wittig uses in the Chantier Littéraire, interlocutional, the emergence of the space is not static or autonomous, it is no more separatist than Wittig's richly intertextual poetic practice. The atopic non lieu is not a utopian circle. As Elle reminded us in Les Guerrières, il faut cesser d'exalter nos vulves, the circle. Rather, Le Corps Lesbien reframes locution and genealogy as a re relational outside, as an edge to be worked. That edge is figured as an incessant, often violent movement of dismemberment and reassemblage, as the border that separates continent and islands, an interlocutional act that poetically remakes the body of the earth, scattered and reconstituted as edges across the monstrous, lesbianized map of a new flat earth, the dole emerges as a heterotopian space endowed with grief and laughter, both utterly real and utterly unreal. Indeed, as I will argue in the next section, it's less a space than a genealogical event produced by a reshaping of locutional acts. And I want to call that event erotic. So, part three. Eros Lucinidas, Eros and Lucifer. In a famous fragment, Sappho writes, Eros once again, Lim Lucifer, whirls me, sweet, bitter, impossible to fight off, creature stealing up. Vitek's lesbian body is an eco-poetic meditation on the agonistic coexistence of love and struggle. Sweet. I timed it, it's not the yeah. Sweetness and bitterness. <laughs> <laughs> what Sappho called Eros Bukubrikan, Eros Sweet Bitter. Vitek's lesbian body is an offering of poetic fragments. Here, the broken words of the broken jeu are gathered together as prayer, as song, as praise for the ontological joke that is the lesbian body. Je me mets à prier sa peau, Vitek writes. Je me mets à chanter à voir très douce gloire à sa peau, ainsi soit-il. Sa peau, tu reprends mes phrases dans ton chant. Gloire à sa peau, je te déchiffre. Sa peau d'adoré, ma sa peau. This experience of praise, a poetic experience, is also an experience of eros, of pleasure and pain, contradiction and paradox, as Anne Carson puts it in Eros the Bittersweet. Once again, as in Benvenis, the gathering together that is poetic is also ironically, paradoxically, a splitting. To perceive eros, this eros can split the mind in two, Anne Carson writes, a splitting figured poetically as dismemberment and scattering, the sapphic body in pieces. Eros Lucinidas. As an eco-erotic experience, Eros Lucinidas, Eros Lindlusner, has implications for how we think the anthropocenic Earth. As Paige Du, I don't know if you pronounce it Dubois or Dubois, but Dubois, okay. So Paige, as Paige Dubois asks and Sappho is burning, what are we to make of these broken things, these fragments, bits of the past assembled for our gaze through random events of destruction and discovery? This question about ancient Greece can be heard, I think, as an eco-poetic one for us today, reassembled as bearers of the name Anthropocene. Following Vitek's sapphic writing, to lesbianize this name, Anthropocene, would be to rewrite it as ironic, as a geontological joke. And indeed, isn't the term Anthropocene, the marker by excellence of the post-human turn, built around a strangely humanist return to Anthropos? to humanism's unmarked human as man, and a return without a difference to a universal man that fails to acknowledge the killing of the two. The new geological construction of a we as anthropocenic is no less suspect than the falsely universal anthropos of human history excoriated by Beauvoir. Read from this perspective, as genealogical in the Foucauldian sense, Le Corps Bien as a limb-loosening erotic movement describes how bits of the past assembled for our gaze, whether as documents in archives or sapphic scraps of papyrus restore to our silent and immobile soil its rifts, its instability, and its flaws, its fight. Eros is a battle, a continual process of dismemberment and recueillement, of the constitution of the polis and its fragmentation, of love and struggle, of tenderness and violence. The sapphic broken tongue is a poetry whose rhythmic breaks voice that violence, speaking over the corpses of others, including the monstrous, sweet, bitter corpse of earth. As Lothal puts it in La Mer, j'ai tué le ventre et je l'écris. Or again in Vitigue, je te tue ainsi mon plus beau monstre. 
In the cataclysmic milieu of a Sappho trashed by time, her remains like limbs loosened from a body and commingled deep within the earth, an event emerges, genealogically, geontologically, as Sappho la Dore, as an offering. Might Vitek's 1973 book be an offering to us today, an untimely present, presence that can help us live the present, what Bach calls that difficult tense. Remembering Vitek, we can adopt the sapphic, erotic stance of an urban eye, the eye of the polis, a political eye in a devastated world. We can practice poiesis as a genealogical, locutional act of offering as contre-champ. To lesbianize the Anthropocene is thus to re-engage a catastrophist imaginary that the term Anthropocene both names and deflects. It is to engage ecological crisis, mass species extinction, and climate change through the lens of a je tu locutional relation as the fracturing, rift, the restoring movement between human and post human. This amour lesbien plunges the je and the tu into those other than human tectonic fractures. But as a poetry of locution, le corps lesbien allows us to think those failles not as abysses, but as edges to be worked. Nous ne portons l'une vers l'autre en grand travail, says the strangely plural voice of that edge work. The travail troubles the boundaries, continent and islands, of the poem's geography of land and water, becoming at certain moments climatological. Je deviens un orage, la foudre, le vent passe dans les trous. L'eau sort et entre et sort de moi. Again, like monsters on all maps, Vitig's monstre adoré, Sappho l'adoré, is less a place to be reached, Je ne pas atteindre le monstre, than it is the evocation of an erotic movement in a space time of devastation. Dans cette graine doré adoré noir. To say goodbye to that devastation, adieu continue noir de misère et de peine, is not to leap into a utopian elsewhere, it is rather to retraverse the pronomial relations that are in their interlocution acts of thought. In that retraversal, we may find, as James Baldwin did in his 1985 essay, Here Be Dragons, that we are the monsters, breathing fire, belching smoke. We are ourselves the edges to be worked, stereoscopic, as Carson puts it in describing Eros, the gap between what is and what we want. That we is not a whole any more than the je, whose locutional act splits it in two in the stereoscopy of writing, as Dana Ward puts it, writing with an ink that dries quick or even quicker if you blow on it with circled lips, like clouds on old maps that blew ships across a flat earth to an edge I don't exactly not idealize. The knife edge of that double negative, an edge I don't exactly not idealize, is the double vision, the stereoscopy of poetry, the emergence of a monster, a gap, a non lieu, a joke, an event that did not take place, the event of the lesbian body. This <coughs> of the of the lesbian body offers a different frame than catastrophism's most prominent contemporary philosophical expressions as a new materialist anti-linguistic turn. Vitek's ironic autobiography of planet Earth retraverses the grammar of a monstrous geontological joke and a transvaluation of the lesbian body and all its violence. As an agonistic, ethical struggle for words, the je tu locutional act reworks the edges of the we, the nous, a catastrophizing ethos that threatens to leave us mute and paralyzed without rifts, ruptures, or fight to be worked. And then just a quick coda. Sappho is burning. As Sandy mentioned, last month's New Yorker ran an essay girl interrupted who was Sappho that we might describe as another strange return of the lesbian body. In Girl Interrupted, classicist Daniel Mendelssohn recounts the exciting recent discoveries, one in 2004, the other in 2012, of two sapphic fragments unearthed from what had once been an ancient municipal dump. These papyrological, pap papyrological finds hardly solve the main problem of Sappho studies, that there's so little Sappho to study. Although scholars in the Library of Alexandria catalog nine books of Sappho's poems four centuries after her death, by the Middle Ages nearly everything had disappeared. Fire, flood, neglect, bookworms, market forces, disapproving church fathers all took their devastating toll. The rarity of the remains makes even the tiniest scraps that much more potent. To read these bits of papyrus is, Mendelssohn writes, a bit like reading a note in a bottle. 
Lekiko Lesbien, the record that holds this fragmented sapphic body, is shot through with comic irony. One source, for example, asserts that Sappho had a gaggle of brothers and a wealthy husband named Kirkilas from the island of Andros. These biographical facts could, however, be little more than a joke. Kirkilas looks a lot like Kerkos, Greek slang for penis, and Andros is very close <laughs> to the word for man. If Sappho has become, as Mendelssohn suggests, a feminist heroine and a gay role model, the ancient encyclopedia turns out to have been unwittingly recycling a tired old joke about an oversexed Sappho who was married to Dick of Man. <laughs> Mendelssohn also points out along similar lines that in classical Greek that the word lesbiazane to lesbianize had a different meaning in ancient Lesbos than it does today. If now we think of love between women, when the ancient Greeks heard the word, they thought of blowjobs. <laughs> lesbiazane meant to act like someone from Lesbos, which meant specifically to perform fellatio, an activity for which inhabitants of the island were thought to have a particular penchant. <laughs> so these phallic musings take us quite a distance from the capuchon brûlant of the clitoral ecstasis VT describes in Le Corps Lesbien. And I want to end this paper with the question of a plural voice, the ethos to which I have already alluded, which Mendelssohn helpfully raises in his New Yorker essay on Sappho. Even when Sappho uses the pers first person singular, Mendelssohn writes, it doesn't mean she was singing solo. In Greek tragedy, the chorus, which numbered 15 singers, regularly uses I. Mendelssohn's comments on the ancient Greek I as a communal voice, the voice of an ethos, is suggestive for rethinking Wittig's split je tu relation as a genealogical reverie on locution, and as I've argued, an offering to a planet, to a deus mamere that is already dead. As Paige Dubois puts it, Sappho is burning. So too, Wittig writes, feu, feu, feu. À midi, ma peau brûlée par le soleil, les flammes ont atteint mon ventre nu, ma taille, mes seins. J'ai commencé à fondre. Mes os mis à nu deviennent incandescents puis tombent en poudre. Je deviens un orage. I want to read this burning, melting, storming earth in conjunction with what Mendelssohn calls Sappho's sexy little fragment 38. You scorch me. That's all it says. <laughs> in reading this fragment through the frame I've offered, we might answer Mendelssohn's question about the communal eye. How should we interpret it? Let's answer it in eco-poetic and eco-poetic terms. If the proper translation of fragment 38 is not, you scorch me, but, as Mendelssohn suggests, you scorch us, might we try to retraverse that communal eye in interlocutional acts of fautage that form the thinking of our ethos? This seems more promising than leaving a fallen subject, tombe but sangreuse grise, as Viti puts it, burned at the stake of a man-shaped Anthropocene and a speculative mystification of objects. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you to uh, join your two talks about Viti's face in, in, in face of the nouvelle histoire and her involvement in that to so dig feet, a materialist um, part of the women's movement. And then, uh, then uh, in the paper, I had to read it three times, I'm sure. But I wanted to ask you about this new materialism that you're talking about, and whether, in fact, a rejection of the linguistic turn is really possible. I mean, right, I mean, movements can't just, you know, uh, so I just want to go through you and just talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, as I said, I, I think that there's a kind of fudging going on in that gesture that it, it refuses to take account of its own locutional acts and its own inscription in a socio-historical process um, that isn't just about abstract philosophical frames where subjectivity is simply a concept, right? And so I, I think that that is common to most of the speculative realist, object oriented ontology, new materialist stuff that I've read. And if, even these categories themselves, though, I think are hard. It's hard to say like, who's in it and who's not in it, because these categories are baggy. It's kind of like affect theory. It's like, who's an affect theorist and who isn't? It's sometimes, or how, how would you like end up defining it? I think is actually difficult um, because there are very, I, I don't want to dismiss the differences among the different thinkers. Um, but I do think that this turn to the object is if we can simply erase 
subjectivity and language is um, an epistemology. Is, is, it, it literally doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> like literally, like I, I literally don't get it. And I, I'm, ser I'm very open to somebody explaining to me how it works, but I've read these books and I, you know, I, I don't understand the sentence, we can know what is, whether we are or not. I don't understand that sentence. So I, I think, but I think because VT is a materialist, both in the sort of Marxist political sense, you know, historical materialism sense, and in the sense of how she is a poet, she's a poet, right, who works, with, I, I see her as a poet who works with words as material. Um, I, I think she is a wonderful source for contesting some of the fudging of the new materialism. And I didn't know that until I started writing my paper. And I was like, oh my god, she's like this old materialist who can like kick ass, you know, against the new materialist stuff. So um, it, was a, it was a nice discovery to see how her work could do that. And to see the, um, what Beth Pognelli calls the geontological dimensions of the Kohlis, which is so much about geography and this movement, this, this, this global movement between continents and islands. So even though it's very much a human story, it's also something other than that, in my view. That's how I read it anyway. Yeah.